So what we're going to study or what we're going to continue to look at is the woes, especially the seventh trumpet or the third woe. We need to uh, have a clear understanding of how that flowed on the charts, okay, and how the pioneers saw it, how a quantum leap has been made from making the seventh trumpet or third woe from what the Bible and the pioneers clearly understood and we will see is even on the chart, okay, to making it all about Islam or modern day Turkey and Israel today is, 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 is quite something, okay? So with that, I'm going to pray and we'll get into our study. Father, I come to the name of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I thank you that we can gather together as brethren to study your word, I pray that you would just open up our understanding, not only in the word, but also in these prophetic charts that were a fulfillment of prophecy, a fulfillment of Habakkuk 2, and really are, in a sense, almost like the Ten Commandments for us in a way. They are, it was a gift that you gave to us as a people to be a foundation of our understanding, to build on. And so I just as the prophet Daniel, I have asked you to forgive me for where I have failed in over the years of teaching uh, of some of these things, going all the way back to five years ago, not adopting all the principles or understanding completely and sharing ideas that were not correct. But I just pray that you'll bless this study tonight, that the truth will come out clearly, that you'll give wisdom and discernment. You promise where two or more are gathered in your name, that there you are in the midst. And we commit all these things into your hands. And we pray this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen. So I was having a discussion with a brother, and he brought up something to me. And he said, you know, because it's like, how do we, well, of course, obviously at some point here in the very near future, we are going to need to deal with Daniel 12, 1. Okay, because that is, for a lot of people, that's like, well, if 45 is fulfilled, then how come we're still here? Why hasn't Michael stood up? Okay, so we're going to get there. Before we go there, though, we need to clearly understand the nature of the fact that 45 is fulfilled and also really understand the nature of just what they believed, where they were at. And I want to share this thought with you. You have to consider that they really believe that they were the last generation. And we are going to return to time studies that we were doing and had been doing that will confirm how long this world has been in existence since day one of creation can be proven through the movements of celestial bodies the sun, moon, stars, and eclipses. We can do this. We're, we're going to go there. We're going to get back to that. But one of the things that William Miller did was he taught that the 6,000 years expired in 1843, which then would open the door to enter into the millennial Sabbath, a day with the Lord is a thousand years. And this was a common understanding of Christianity, okay, at that time. And is actually being agitated again. There are people that are talking about this. In some ways, they're time setting. We're not going to do that. We do have a clear principle for the season or generation that will be right before Christ's coming. That we can talk about that. That's perfectly fair. And that's what we will need to do. But I digress. The thing is, is that they really believe they were the last generation. Okay, they thought that they would be the ones that would finish it, and rightfully so. The Lord did want to finish it, and it's clear in spirit of prophecy that that is the desire or was the desire. Now, we're still here. Okay, why is that? Well, I believe we just have to let the word of God speak on that, and that's because the Lord is long suffering. And he's not willing that any should perish. And he wants to save as many as he can. 
in light of all the deception the enemy is throwing at us, <laughs> the ones that are supposed to finish this and give the message. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. So many of us are here or know each other because we came to understand about the deception that came into Seventh-day Adventism around the Trinity and how a false idea around our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and their spirit and how it works with us for our salvation was decimated, starting with a book by Living called Living Temple by Kellogg, okay, and then developing a doctrine that ultimately allowed not Trinity the way the Catholic Church per se teaches it, but still it's Trinity, no matter how you cut it. And it's not according to the Bible. But that brought us together. So, all right, so we know <laughs> just from that one thing alone, the deception has come in. Now, we would be very naive, brother, if we thought that that was the only deception that the devil would pull. And I'll tell you this, the devil definitely doesn't care if you believe the father's son message. If you're not going to be on time waiting for your Lord and Savior to come, because the promise is blessed are those who he finds watching and waiting for his appearing. All right. Now, I want to give you an illustration before we begin here. Let's just say that, and this happens to me sometimes, and I'm sure all of you can relate. You misplace your keys, your car keys. And let's just say that I misplaced my car keys in the bedroom, but I'm convinced that they're in the living room. All my searching in the living room will never produce the keys, will they? Because the keys are not in the living room. They're in the bedroom, all right? So I can dig, I can turn the whole living room upside down. I can take everything out. I can do the best. I can come up with every reason why those keys are in the living room. But if they're not in the living room, if they're in the bedroom, I will never find them. And they're in a similar circumstance right now prophetically, okay? And that is what's being exposed. It's making some people very upset. Well, too bad. <laughs> if you are looking <laughs> in the wrong place for an answer that can never be found there, then all your searching and all your excuses and all your ideas that you try to bring forward to support the place you're looking where you shouldn't be looking, well you'll never find it. So let's talk about the seventh trumpet or the third woe, because they are one and the same. And I'm gonna show you a statement this evening from 1900 that shows very clearly when Uriah Smith and A.T. Jones were both working at the Review and Errol together. They clearly understood it in 1900, okay, what this was. But let me share screen and let's take a look at some prophetic charts. Let's begin with the 1843 chart. On the 1843 chart, and we remember that as these charts progressed, okay, this is something we should keep in mind, that as these charts progressed, they were uh, a growing of understanding of our message and then a desire to simplify the message. So I remember the first time I saw this, the very first time I saw an 1843 chart. I'll never forget it. The very first time I ever saw it was in a hotel room in upstate New York. I was in Plattsburgh, New York. They're buying books at the universities there. And I came across a video. I actually was searching Walter Veith, how to study the Bible. And I searched on YouTube and what came back in the search was Walter Bythe is a false prophet. And I was like, Walter Bythe's a false prophet? How is that? I mean, Walter Bythe, well, I mean, he's the, like, you know, to me at that time was the pinnacle. And for many of, of understanding, especially around the papacy and all the esoteric things that have happened, you know, throughout history and that we should be looking for, I was like, how is he a false prophet? And there was a gentleman from Africa preaching 
and teaching, and he had two charts behind him, and this was the one of the charts he had behind him, he had the 1843 and the 1850 chart, excuse me. So I've never seen this before in my life. <laughs> and I'm looking at it, I'm like, how in the world can you understand that? Now, brethren, I understand it now. And it's not as difficult as it looks. But if you don't have the right principles, you won't understand it. It will be difficult. But what we want to focus in on here is this, what we've been talking about, okay? Then what they understood. And that has to do with these woe trumpets, right? These woe angels, the fifth, sixth, seventh trumpet. Now, with the fifth trumpet, what do we see? We see the Mohammedans or the Saracens, okay? Then with this sixth trumpet or second woe, it has Mohammedans, but really it's, it's the Ottoman Turk or the Ottoman Turkish Empire, okay? But then when we come to the seventh trumpet or third woe, wait a minute, there's nothing, like nothing below it. They just didn't really understand it. It was really not for them to understand, was it? Why? Because they believed that Christ was coming in 1843 and they were preaching the first angel's message. And that's all they understood. They had no light on the second angel's message or the third angel's message, or all the other light that advanced beyond where they were just in general at this time that this chart was made. But nothing is here, okay? Now, their understanding advanced. By 1850, they have understood the disappointment of 43, and also the disappointment of October 22nd, 1844. They've come to understand the second angel's message, and they've actually now entered into the understanding of the third angel's message and its relation to the Sabbath and Christ's priestly ministry moving from the holy place into the most holy place, and that we're at the investigative judgment. And on the chart, we see here very clearly that, again, they're dealing with these three woe angels or the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet. They're synonymous with each other. And so now we have, again, the Mohammedans or the Saracens under the fifth trumpet. We have under the sixth or second woe the Ottoman supremacy. But look here. It ceased in 1840. Okay, and the seventh trumpet or the third angel begins to sound. Now, there's no illustration below. What they've done here is they've actually listed out events. Okay, the third woe cometh quickly. And what did they list out? Well, brethren, let's go take a look. I invite you to open with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10. In Revelation chapter 10, and we want to read here in verse seven, because that's on the chart, okay? That's that's the first, you can't see it. I, I can't read it to you because if I it magnify it, it's blurred, so you can't see it. But if you could actually see it, you would see that they're quoting verse seven. And then they move to Revelation chapter 11, and, and then they list that out as well. So what they do is they list out the events, okay? of what will transpire under the seventh trumpet or the third woe is what they do. And so they list verse seven first. 
which reads, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, which we're living in those days, the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. So when the seventh angel begins to sound, and, and we need to understand the seventh angel, we need to understand the seventh trumpet because it is indicative of us understanding why there seems to be this big gap between 45 and 12 one. Okay. So it will all work together. We're going to get there. We want to be firmly settled though on 45 first, because otherwise it's not going to help you very much <laughs> to just go ahead and try to explain 12 one. Uh, if you're not really settled that 45 is definitely fulfilled. And then also, as we're looking here, what their real mindset was, because they never taught, okay, never, ever taught that the third woe had anything to do with the Turk in any form or fashion. Never, ever. This is what they did teach, okay? So we read this verse. Now, I think it's interesting, and we should keep reading just for our own understanding because of who we are, because Nothing has taken the Lord off of guard, all right? Especially our Heavenly Father, because he's the one that declares the end from the beginning. I mean, that's what makes him who he is. Okay, the Ancient of Days, why is he the Ancient One? Because he knows all time. He is all time. He saw this meeting tonight. He saw and knows what I will say before I'll ever say it. He won't violate my free will in any form or fashion but he knows even how this meeting will end. He even knows what I will say in a closing prayer, even though I don't know what I'm going to say necessarily in a closing prayer. So nothing is catching him off guard is what we need to understand. Okay, so under the sounding of this seventh trumpet, all these things will be fulfilled. It will come to an end. And watch what we read here in verse eight. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book, which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. Now, that little book is the book of Daniel, which we are studying extensively. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, give me the little book. And he said unto me, take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall, uh, it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Sweet as honey in that they really believed that Christ was coming in their day bitter in their belly because he didn't come. They were disappointed. They were disappointed twice. Disappointed twice. And then what does it say here in verse 10? And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Now they understood very clearly that this was talking about them. They understood very clearly that the disappointment of 1843 and the disappointment of October 22nd, 1844 would mean that they still must prophesy again. But now 175 years have passed. And brethren, we must now prophesy again. We must build the walls, the waste places. You see, the walls have been torn down. Babylon came into Adventism and took it captive. And the Lord is trying to bring us back to where we were before all these false doctrines came into our church within the second generation of Adventists. And this history around A.G. Daniels and Prescott, Kellogg, Wagner, Jones, all very important to understand. And most people don't talk about it nor understand that the 1919 sessions, all of these things, okay, that happened, that tore down the walls of Adventism, that must be rebuilt. And in a sense, brethren, we're like Nehemiah's. We've got to go back. We've got to build the wall. And as we're building the walls, we've got to fight everybody off because they're trying to tell you, no, that's not right. That's not how it is, whatever. But yes, we are to prophesy again. We are to declare the message and I'll read you a quote this evening. It's going to show you why that is the way it is. But anyway, 
we're dealing with the seventh trumpet. So then what is written on the chart there? We're going to go back and look at it here in a moment. But what is written? Now, what's next? Well, then we would then jump to Revelation chapter 11, and we would be in verse 14. Okay, this is what's listed on the chart, the 1850 chart. This is what they did. This is so as they put the seventh trumpet to the third woe, then they just wrote the Bible verses underneath it. Okay, to tell you how it progresses and what it is. It's nothing to do with the Turk or Islam or anything. It's listed out right here for us. And the second woe is past. We're in verse 14. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Okay, so and that's what's happening because the kingdom is becoming his. He's numbering his subjects right now in the investigative judgment. And it, the, in essence, the kingdom is already his, okay? He just hasn't come to take it. It's his. It's promised. In verse 16, and the four and 20 elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry. And that's where we are right now. We are in the angry nations. And we have seen ever since 1844, the nations have become more and more angry. And thy wrath is come. That's what we're right up against right now, brethren. And the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets and the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So we get our reward when Christ comes and takes us. And then a thousand years later, the wicked get their reward for not accepting salvation. They're destroyed by fire. This is all happening under the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And then in verse 19, or excuse me, yes, verse 19, and the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple, the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail, which is in essence, again, describing the coming of our Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. So let's go back here and look at this again. So this is what they did. Okay, this is our pioneers. I'm not pulling any punches. I'm merely showing exactly what they did. Okay, this is how they did the seventh trumpet or the third woe. No mystery here. Now, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Do you see anybody teaching this today? I don't. <laughs> I mean, should be taught, should be teaching it, which it had been taught to me a long time ago. I never have ever, ever seen this taught in what was called the present truth movement that has called attention to the charts. Now, I've seen a lot of talk about the seventh trumpet or the third woe being Islam, but I've never seen this done, what I just did right now. But hey, it's right there, right in front of you. And you know what it is? And I'm just going to say this, and I'm going to go off the screen share again here real quick, just to say this, is, is this. Shame on me and shame on you. Shame on all of us for not starting to show ourselves approved. Okay? I'm no better than anybody in this room or anybody that will see this video in the future. Shame on all of us. We didn't study to show ourselves approved. We listened to other men. I did it. I'm just as guilty. So listen. I'm on the same boat, okay? I listened to other men. I accepted their ideas I, because what they seemed like they sounded good, they looked good. I Maybe uh, I didn't feel like I was smart enough to figure it out, whatever it may be, whatever the excuse was, but shame on us, okay? That we didn't study show ourselves approved, but it's right there. So what do we do? We just say, I'm sorry, forgive me. <laughs> And let's take up the banner of truth. Let's build the walls of truth. And let's go forward 
let's get this thing done and let's go home before we also are indicted with treason because it's a treasonous thing that has happened over the years now in Adventism and the failure of past generations to do what God had given them to do. And brethren, I'm determined that I'm not going to be indicted with treason. And I'm in, determined to try to help everyone that may come in contact with us as a ministry, that they would not be indicted with treason as well, because treason is in essence then not fighting for your country or your kingdom when there is a war taking place. And we are in the midst of a spiritual war. And if we're not fighting with the true message, then we're really not fighting for the kingdom or for our king. And so then we'll be held guilty for treason. Lord help us. Now what happened? Well, then we as a church denominated, okay? If you know our history, this is 1850, okay? It was a time when there still was, a, there were a lot of ideas. I mean, there, there are people that try to come out and say, well, you know, James White in 1857 wrote that, that the king of the North was the papacy. Okay, well, so what? He wrote that in 1857. Their time, they progressed in their understanding. James White said that. Does that make it the end all be all? No, it doesn't. It doesn't make it the end all be all. They had different ideas about things, but they were coming together. And they denominated in 1863. And in 1863, a chart is made. And it's this chart right here. Forgive me for not having it in color. I can't find it anywhere online in color. But this is the 1863 chart, okay? And now they've taken a lot of the writing that was on the 1843 and 1850 chart, all of it, off of it, because they wanted to simplify it and they wanted to make it, I mean, come on, you know, we're to take this message to the world. So they wanted to make it as, as unintimidating as possible, but yet at the same time, our message and of course, if you were a good Seventh-day Adventist and you understood the truth, you could teach with this chart, our whole message. But look, here we are again. We're looking at the trumpets. Here we have the sixth trumpet. Okay. We got the Saracene. We got the, uh, excuse me, fifth trumpet. We've got the sixth trumpet, second woe, the Ottoman Turk. And then we got the third woe, and what happened here? Well, they didn't list anything out, and it just kind of, the visions of John, the visions of Daniel and John. So this is an 1863 chart. Now, brethren, I'm nothing special, but I'm going to tell you something. I had something given to me years ago, and ever since the Lord raised me back up to speak again, it's been behind me, consistently always behind me, because, brethren, it does show the true nature of how this works. This is a reprinting of the 1863 chart. This was printed in the 1880s. And again, we see here the woes, fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet, Saracen, Turk, but the third woe. Now it's right, brethren, as it should be, is Christ. The third woe, or the seventh trumpet, is around the coming of Christ. As we read there in Revelation chapter 11, verse 17, saying, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. The seventh trumpet of the third woe is about Christ coming to reign and reign forever. As far as I know, brethren, I'm the only one in the world that has this chart, at least openly teaching it. And if you know someone else who is teaching this, or understands this, then by all means, introduce them to me because I want to clasp hands with them and work with them and go forward. But this is the truth 
of the seventh trumpet or the third woe. Think about it. And we've been dealing in this truth, brethren. We are dealing in the truth. And we will continue to prove it's the truth. We're not going to stop. And that may make some people mad. I had somebody write me today, send me an email, tell me I'm full of pride. Whatever. It's not about pride. It's about the truth. Is it the truth or not? What, because I don't harmonize with your false ideas? With your false teaching, I'm full of pride? No, I don't think so. You're full of pride. Humble yourself and study and see that this is what it's about. It's not about Islam, the third war, the seventh trumpet. It's about the coming of Jesus Christ. And we need to be able to trace, if we understand, how to follow Daniel and the Revelation. We can see that history and prophecy agree. And we can know that we can be pretty accurate in watching and waiting for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And not only for ourselves, but also for the warning of others. So with that then, I wanna show you something here. This is Review and Herald. You must understand there has been a suppression, okay? There is a suppression, we saw it when we did this study on uh, the 1897 Daniel Revelation as related to a digital copy uh, that we would find in the Ellen White CD-ROM edition. There are certain Review and Herald articles that if you don't have the hard copy, it's very hard to find, okay? Um, but this right here, Review and Herald from Battle Creek, October 9th, 1900. Notice who the two editors are, A.T. Jones and Uriah Smith in 1900. Talking about the third angel's message, and talking about the time, which is what we're dealing in, and look what they say. We have shown that the sixth and seventh trumpet angels ceased to sound August 11th, 1840, that then as says the scriptures, now keep in mind, this is being written in 1900 now, 60 years later, and they've not changed their minds. The second woe is passed, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Revelation 11, 14. The third woe and the seventh trumpet are what? Identical. We don't separate them from each other. We see, and I heard a popular minister just heard them this week and one of the messages that they did not very long ago, they say the third woe is Islam. Well, if they're saying the third woe is Islam, then they're saying the seventh trumpet is Islam. And that's a virtual impossibility from what we've just seen already. If they just would study the charts and they would understand the true nature of what was believed by the pioneers. And they love to quote A.T. Jones, which is really interesting. They really like to quote him too. Of course, they like to quote him in the later 1900s when he'd become bitter. We got some things to show you around that as well. But the point is, is that they understood very clearly the third woe and the seventh trumpet are identical. And then it says, when the seventh angel sounded, said the prophet, there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And now is the time. The prophet also said the nations were angry. This we have seen fulfilled in the nation since 1844, even to the present hour. The nations that are now in distress and perplexity of the China entanglement. Of course, so I don't profess to be so savvy on China and what was going on then in 1900. But just as we discussed this last Sabbath, you can see that Brother Bill Cave and Indwelling Word are not pulling any punches. We are just in harmony with what was always taught. It's what that's all we've been doing. Why it's making people so mad? I'm having a hard time understanding because... It's not like I'm coming up with anything special. We're just finding it and we're repeating it. The prophet further said, thy wrath is come in the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldst give reward unto thy servants, the prophets and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldst destroy them which destroy the earth or corrupt the earth. And the temple of the God, the temple of God was opened in heaven 
And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thundering and an earthquake and great hail. Revelation 11, 18, and 19. So it's very important to understand that, and perhaps in the future, I may revamp this a little bit and build even more on this theme around the seventh trumpet of the third woe. But it's very important to understand that there is no connection whatsoever to Islam, to the Ottoman Turk, Turkey, whatever. None, none, zero, zilch. Don't do it, okay? And don't listen to anybody who's doing it because they're teaching error. They don't have anything to offer you at this point because they have stepped off the platform even if they say that they're on it. And as we close this evening, brother, I came across this statement as I was studying over this. The present is a solemn, fearful time for the church. The angels are already girded, awaiting the mandate of God to pour their vials of wrath upon the world. Okay, so this is the heavenly angels, God's angels. They're already awaiting. That's in 1890. You talk about the idea of, of Michael standing up, okay, standing as king, preparing to come. Destroying angels are taking up the work of vengeance. For the spirit of God is gradually withdrawing from the world. Satan also, or is also, mustering his forces of evil going forth under the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them under his banner to be trained for the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now, that's interesting because, you know, looking back now, we can see how well the enemy has trained the world to be prepared to fight against God. But we'll talk more about that next week. Satan is to make most powerful efforts for the mastery in the last great conflict. And here's what I want you to pay careful attention to, brethren. Fundamental principles will be brought out and decisions made in regard to them. Fundamental principles will be brought out and decisions made in regard to them. Skepticism is prevailing everywhere. Ungodless abounds. The faith of individual members of the church will be tested as though there were not another person in the world. And how will you be tested? And how will you either pass or fail? Will be by the fundamental principles that are brought out and decisions that you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, will make in regard to them. I invite anyone to indict me on where I have failed to work with fundamental principles that are necessary for decisions to be made in regard to where we are and where we stand in this earth's history. You can defame my character. You can call me whatever you will. But you cannot show that fundamental principles have not been brought out and have been used in any truth that has been advanced thus far. Now, for those of you that have been keeping up with this, you realize that right now we are at least four messages that still need to be released just to catch up those who have not been with us. It will be clearly shown that the fundamental principles have been laid out and you're going to have to make a decision about what you do with them. It's nothing to do with Bill Cave. Not my problem. <laughs> I've made my decisions on the principles and I'm striving to go forward with them. And I'm striving to show you that yes, indeed, he's coming, and he's coming very soon. And I hope, it's my sincere desire and prayer, that we all will be ready to meet him. I hope that we all will meet in the kingdom of heaven. Even those that right now may even be in conflict with me and not like me. You know, I've been reading about King David. 
And one of the things I saw about David's character was he was always merciful to his enemies. He always sought to try to be reconciled to those who had come against him. He was indicative of a character of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I just want everyone to know that's how I want to be with anyone who's come against me in the past. Let's unite on the truth, okay? And let's go forward and finish this thing before they do everything they can to kill us all, because that's exactly what they're trying to do now. And with that, I'm going to close in prayer. Father, again, I come to you, may your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you so much for your love and mercy to us. I thank you that you have laid the fundamental principles down. We can see them rather visually or written. There is all over our message. I just pray that you continue to bless us all with wisdom and understanding to uncover these things, to find these things, because we know the devil wants to bury them under the rubbish. I think of the dream of William Miller's casket and of the jewels and how the jewels that represent the truth of our message, the precious jewels of truth, and also those that will be gathered with them, how he has tried to just cover them in dust and dirt. But you sent in the man with the brush and he was able to gather up all the jewels and put them back in the casket and the truth shone brighter and more glorious than ever. And I pray that we be counted worthy to be a manifestation and a fulfillment of that very prophetic dream that you gave to William Miller. Help us finish this work is my sincere prayer. And I pray these things in the mind of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen.